Hi everyone, I'm Patrick Fingston from TheIllinois.com, joined by Paul Vallis, former CEO of the uh, Chicago Public Schools, as well as a former uh, candidate for Lieutenant Governor, as well as Mayor of Chicago. Uh, Paul, I, I appreciate the time, and, and since, since there's so much consternation about schools right now and and you know you have a, a history of reform in schools I, I was wondering your your thoughts on return to in-person learning um there's a lot of pushback from teachers uh you know a lot of folks that are concerned about going back while while COVID-19 continues to be an issue in the state should we should there be more of a focus and not necessarily just Chicago the CTU gets a ton of of, of, of airtime, is should there be a higher priority on reopening schools? Well, first of all, schools should have been reopened. I, I, um, by May, it was pretty much determined that schools posed minimal risks for children, that children were least likely to uh, suffer serious, uh, um, seriously from the pandemic and that the schools were, and that children were least likely to be contagious. Uh, you know, it was also, you know, by about May or June, it, 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 it was, there was enough evidence out there to indicate that schools themselves would not be uh, centers for spreading the virus. So, you know, all the science and all the research and all the experience points to the fact that schools could be open safely and that uh, the schools would not become centers for transmitting the virus. Now, let me point out that schools all over the country have opened. Many public schools have opened, many to a hybrid model. Some have opened fully. And, uh, and of course, parochial uh, schools and private schools, for the most part, have opened too. And yet all their experience points to just how safe schools can be. And in New York, where they, if you remember, they shut down the whole system uh, uh, when there was a spike in the infection rates Within, within the city. And then of course, parents demanded that schools be reopened and the mayor reversed himself. I think the, uh, the uh, even in areas that had in the city that had seen a significant increase in infections, you did not see it in the school. So all the science supports the reopening of schools with the proper precautions and, and all the uh, research points to the destructive impact, remote learning, exclusive remote learning uh, uh, or even hybrid models have on children academically, social, emotionally, not to mention the impact on poor working families. And of course, all the experience indicates that schools and school districts that have reopened, uh, there have not been any serious healthcare consequences. So there's no reason, there's no justification to keep schools closed. What do you think, should it be across the board? Because I remember, you know, during the summer, you had a lot of instances where like high school football teams would be having their, their workouts that they were allowed to have and there were some outbreaks. And, and obviously older kids, the 16, 17, 18 year olds are more likely to contract and spread COVID than, than a little kid as, as my understanding of, of, of the science out there. Is, is, this an, is this an all or nothing scenario in your mind? No, it's not. As I mentioned, I, look, the professional sports teams have been <laughs> have been playing. Uh, yeah, at the end of the day, I think you, if you follow the CDC, the precautions, you do your social distancing, you do your cleaning. Uh, there are, you know, you mask. Uh, uh, for example, if you're participating in the sport when you're not in the field, there are things that you can take to minimize the risks. Uh, uh, you know, the, the larger issue. I, I think there have been five. Uh, uh, individuals in the state of Illinois, 19 years or younger who have died from COVID. Uh, and, uh, and so, I mean, there's been, they, it, and that's in, I think the sh uh, Chicago area, and there's been 25 times or the number who have been murdered in, in the community, uh, in the community this year in that age group. So at the end of the day, it, you know, it's pretty, uh, you can take steps to reopen schools. You can take steps to engage in, uh, to re-engage in contact sports if you follow the proper procedures. Most states have reopened their sports programs, by the way. Illinois is like lagging the rest in terms of reopening schools, in terms of the state taking a proactive role and making sure that schools get open, in terms of uh, 
providing schools with the autonomy to uh, restart their sports programs if they elect to do so. So, so you know, we're not we're not leading the way by any stretch of the imagination, and most states have in fact. Look, you know, there's a there's a new strain of the virus in England, and yet uh, uh, Boris Johnson has refused to close his schools. As have most of the European countries because of the damage that's being done to kids, and because of the reasons that I cited, the support of the science and and obviously the experience that kids aren't getting infected, they're not spreading the disease, and uh, and um, and and they're su suffering in some cases uh, irreparable damage from basically going nine, 10 months uh, without on-site in-school instruction. You know, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, pediatricians and uh, child health care advocates will tell you uh, uh, about the, the damage that is done to primary grade kids, uh, to kindergartners, to preschool kids, when they're, you know, when you are substituting remote learning from uh, in-school, on-site preschool, on-site kindergarten, on-site primary grade instruction, you know, the brain development in those early years is occurring with, uh, with great rapidity and permanent damage can be done. Uh, you know, I think the, uh, th there are some studies that said that children at, at, at a very young age should not be exposed to more than one hour a day of basically kind of the online, uh, you know, uh, interaction or online education. So real damage is being done. And, and then look at the streets of Chicago. Um, through, um, through, no, through December 10th, that's the, last, uh, that's, the last date that I, uh, that's the last date I have complete data for. There are 83 school-age children who were murdered in the city of Chicago, 83, including 14 under the age of 10. And, uh, and so every day in Chicago, there are, uh, are 100,000 high school kids either at home or walking the street many in very dangerous communities. I mean, the gangs are having a field day. The police have told me that as many as 25, 30% of the carjackings are being performed by teenagers. So it's, it's having a catastrophic impact on the inner city, on poor families. Think of working families. Look at the data that, that, that uh, there's been data that's, uh, there is data that tracks the reemployment of people post, uh, post uh, COVID, post the, uh, you know. And so, uh, Upper income and middle income uh, employment has pretty much returned to the pre-COVID levels. Where in Illinois, lower income employment is uh, is uh, is 25 percent less than it was pre-COVID, and in Chicago, it's 33, 34 percent less than pre-COVID. So imagine the devastation that uh, that working families are experiencing. And you know when schools opened in uh, in late August and September, uh, there was an there was an increase in unemployment. Uh, the number of people who went on unemployment grew by something like 1.1 million. 80 percent of that new unemployment were women. Were women? Why? What happened? <laughs> what happened was they had to quit their jobs because the schools weren't open. So think of the economic devastation on working families, particularly on poor working families. So schools need to be open. Schools should have been open. They should have reopened. Even the hybrid models need to be modified enough to accommodate working parents. They can be open safely. And it's just the unions, many of the national teachers unions trying to exploit the situation uh, to basically protect their members for the convenience of their members and, and, uh, and to kind of maximize uh, or to put pressure on both uh, state and federal governments to provide more funding. Isn't, isn't that the job of the union now is to protect its members? Well, the job is to protect its members, uh, but the primary job is to serve the kids. And when your members can't be protected, because like the Chicago Public Schools have basically said, if teachers have pre-existing conditions, those teachers can teach remotely. Remember, the, uh, let's use as ex an example of the Chicago Public Schools. What have they said? They said, we want to reopen schools, not for high school kids. Their plan doesn't set a date for returning high school kids to, I mean, the gangbangers are having them. You think the gang, the organized gangs in Chicago are, are uh, following uh, Governor Pritzker's protocols about social distancing and about not engaging? <laughs> you know, they're out there recruiting. Uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the shooters who, who killed that, that uh, uh, retired firefighter in Beverly was a teenager. 
I think it was what 15, 16 years old is my understanding. So, so you know, it's it's a uh, you know it's you don't you don't put out misinformation first of all, and, and and when the science says you can open schools safely, and when the schools say, when when the schools say that uh, if teachers have pre-existing conditions or if they're in that at-risk category, they can work remotely. What's the problem here? Plus, schools are reopening uh, uh, for for uh, parents who who elect to send their kids to to a, to a school. If they're if, if a parent wants their child to continue to learn remotely because they have concerns, uh, uh, even if it's not grounded in science, parents have an obligation. Parents are going to you know uh, exercise. Uh, maximum caution when it comes to their children. Parents have the option of sending their kids to school or keeping them at home. So this idea that suddenly schools are going to reopen and we're going to have hundreds and hundreds of kids in school and thousands of kids in high school, this is not happening. Those school, only about, I think only about 30 or 40 percent of the parents who were surveyed indicated that they were going to return their, their kids to school. So there's no reason. There's no, I, I think the unions define this because, uh, define the schools because they believe they can and and they think, at least when it comes to the Chicago Teachers Union, they can have their cake and eat it too. In other words, they can have remote learning and still get their pay raises and still get their longevity bonuses and not lose any any of their vacation or sick days. Or for that matter, and, and the Teachers Union can continue to, to gain hundreds of members, uh, uh, which have been written into the new contract because all the nurses in the schools have to be union nurses, et cetera. It's, you know, they've, they've called the district's bluff twice by striking the first time and then threatening to strike the second time. And so why shouldn't they, why shouldn't they uh, 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 keep on intimidating the district when they're getting exactly what they want? You, you, you say the unions are doing this for, for more funding, um, you know, and, and whether it's CTU or, or IFT or IEA, um, obviously, you know, they want more investment from the state in schools. And, of course. And every, I think, I think, Everybody who doesn't want their property tax bill to skyrocket even higher wants more funding for schools. But, but how does that really make a difference here? I mean, it's it's not like I mean, I, I suppose it could be a, an effort for a pay raise. But, but I mean, what what kind of funding are you talking about here? Well, look, you know, the teachers obviously uh, are always advocating for more money. I, I as a school superintendent who have negotiated four collective bargaining agreements always on time without ever laying off a teacher or without ever having to close the school because I didn't uh, need to close schools because my enrollment was always growing. Uh, um, you know, I raised teacher salaries, I think collectively, 38% uh, in those contracts, not counting your longevity bonuses and pay increases. So that wasn't even counting that. You know, so I'm all for paying teachers the first salary. But I think the unions look, you know, they can ensure that they can accommodate every one of their members. You know, they can work remotely. I'm sure the majority of the teachers union, uh, 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 the, the rank and file teachers want to get back. They want to get back to their classrooms. But I believe that there's a strong, a, a, a large block out there of uh, union members who do not. And, you know, you know, if, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think. The union is trying to accommodate them. Plus, why shouldn't they? They're paying no cost for schools not being open. They're paying no cost for refusing. And the Chicago Teachers Union just, what, over the weekend said, if and they're not striking, but if any of their members don't want to show up for work, they don't have to and they support them. So I, I think the union is, uh, the federal government just, just appropriated $56 billion for K-8 elementary and secondary education. Uh, for the Chicago public schools, that's $800 million. Uh, uh, minus the $80 million that has to go, that they have to channel to private schools and to parochial schools, that's $720 million on top of the $204 million that they got in the first round of COVID. That's $900 million people. You mean you can't get schools open? You can't make sure that they're, they're, they, they, they've got a, a strategy for uh, uh, the, ensuring that the schools are properly ventilated and properly cleaned. Uh, you know, you can't, you, you know, that money can't, uh, can't be invested in ways that can upgrade the quality of remote learning in case teachers who have pre-existing conditions need to teach from a distance. There's no excuses. There's no excuses 
based on what other districts have done and experienced and other parochial and private schools have experienced and what's been done internationally for schools in Chicago or schools anywhere in the state of Illinois not to be open uh, to uh, parents who want their children uh, in school, who want their children to be participating in, in on-site instruction. As hands-on as the governor has been during this crisis, uh, with with business shutdowns and, and limitations and groups and mask mandates, et cetera, he's continually deferred to to local school districts for reopening plans. Uh, and and I, I'm a big local control guy naturally anyway. But um, are you are you saying that he should have more of a of an active role in, in mandating some opening statewide? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of conservative governments and uh, governors in in red states who are more inclined to be support, you know, to be less authoritarian and less dictatorial and more supportive of obviously local control have in fact pressed, pressed their schools, pressured their schools through their state superintendents and state education commissioners to get those doors open. I mean, why is the federal government allocating billions, tens of billions of dollars to schools if they're going to continue to basically perform remotely. Look, the head of the Chicago Teachers Union the other day said, oh, uh, the vaccine is on its way, so um, less of an urgency to open. We'll just wait for the vaccine. When? Uh, April, May, June. I mean, when kids have them been out of school effectively or off of school campus for 12 or 14 months, when more kids in the city of Chicago will have been shot by the street gangs or crossed caught up in the crossfire or when the academic gap was all the evidence points out to the significant widening of the achievement gap uh, 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 based on income uh, and, and because of the disproportionate number of poor families who are black and Latino, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a growing, the grow, there's a growing divide and even greater growing of that academic divide between black and Latino and white children. So at the end of the day, serious damage. Imagine the damage that's being done to special needs kids. How do you provide for uh, special needs instruction for a child with severe autism or many of the other special challenges that children experience? Imagine the burden on a special needs parent who has to basically homeschool her special needs kid. It's just education malpractice. And, and someone needs to file a class action lawsuit. It's time to file a class action lawsuit on behalf of parents to demand that parents be afforded educational choice. If we're gonna spend, if, if we're gonna spend 66% of our property taxes on public education, which is what we spend collectively in Illinois, it's 55%, 54% in Chicago, and it's well over 70% in most suburbs, probably in the, the district that you live, it's probably 73, 74%. I mean, then why shouldn't parents be able to have school choice. When the union tells its individual teachers, you have the choice, we support your choice on whether or not, regardless of what the district says, we support your choice on whether or not you wanna to go to school or continue to teach remotely. Well, why can't parents have a choice? Why can't parents have a choice of where to send their kids to school? But, but why shouldn't we wait for teachers to get the vaccine? I mean, there clearly, you know, there are plenty of older teachers who are, who are in more of a, a susceptible group you know, where they, they can, they are moved to the front of the line, um, you know, already, you know, we're near the front of the line already. Why, why shouldn't we just wait that time to make sure that we know that the adults in the building who can get the disease, who can spread the disease, who can get the disease from kids who may have it, um, can be safer and make sure that the schools stay safe. Well, because if individuals fall into that risk category, uh, school districts are giving them the option to continue to teach remotely. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a one size fits all. It's not, it's not a one size fits all. Basically, the school districts have said if you have pre existing conditions, you can get permission to teach remotely. It's as simple as that. That's not what we're talking about here. No one's talking about that. And it's not about talking, uh, putting people at risk. Look at the archdiocese. I saw a statistic where the archdiocese had tested 20,000 students and like 2,200 teachers. And I think, I don't know, 24 students tested positive and less than 20 teachers tested positive. And, I, and it's, 
I'm not aware of any fatalities. I mean, the bottom line is, it's, you know, the children, a, a story just came out today. I, I believe it was in the Tribune or the Sun Times, where basically they said that children are more at risk uh, uh, of getting and transmitting the, the disease at home in their communities than they are at school, that the schools may in fact be the safest place. And, and a, a, a long list of physicians uh, did an op-ed piece that was printed, I think, in both the major papers in Chicago, uh, calling on the reopening of schools. Fauci has talked about uh, consistently about the reopening of schools. So it's not that we're trying to put people with serious pre-existing conditions uh, uh, at risk, or even people who are in a certain age group. You know what I mean? Look, I, you know, I'm not. I've had COVID. My boys have had COVID. They're first responders. My wife is a first responder. Uh, she hasn't gotten it yet. We're still trying to figure that out because she worked at the airport all the time. So my one son's a police officer. My other son's a firefighter. I think 1,500 police officers have gotten COVID. All these first responders and essential workers have been out there, 55 million strong, have been out there every day, not threatening to strike, not saying we want to do our work remotely because it can't be done, um, making sac sacrifices, ma taking on much greater risks than you take on by teaching in a school. So at the end of the day, uh, this, is, this is the fault of the union leadership, uh, basically telling their members, you can have your cake and eat it too, telling their members they're not gonna be impacted and they can teach remotely. Uh, because maybe, maybe a, a small percentage of the teachers are in need of, of, uh, of, of, you know, in need of having the option of teaching remotely because of their age or because of their pre-existing condition. Paul, before I let you go, um, that's okay. You sure sound like a, an education reform candidate. Uh, you know, you ran for lieutenant governor with Pat Quinn in 2014. You ran for mayor in 2019. Are you are you getting back into the arena? No, no, no not at all. I, you know, I'm continuing to do the things I did during the campaign. Let me point out that that you know, I ran for office against Rob Blagojevich. If you remember, I challenged mm -hmm. the Democratic Party back in 2001. And, and I did it because I felt the party needed a challenge. And I came within, what, one and a half percentage points of winning. Of course, Roland Burris was in that primary, too. He finished third. Um, you know, when I came back to Illinois to run for lieutenant governor, I felt that Pat Quinn had done a good job as governor. And I felt that that uh, he needed four more years. They were making progress on the budget. Uh, he had even made progress on the issue of pension reforms. You know, obviously, he had supported a property tax increase or an income tax increase that helped pay down the, the state's obligations. He had been willing to stand up to many individuals in the legislature. I thought Pat had done a great job. Pat had invited me to run and, and, or to, to come and help him, and I did. He and I have been friends for a long time. I decided to challenge Rahm Emanuel because it was pretty clear that no one was going to challenge him. And I felt he had done an atrocious job. Uh, not only with the schools, but with the budget, uh, with the city debt, obviously uh, totally degraded the police department by not filling police vacancies, uh, literally devastating the detectives division that resulted in a spike in crime, not to mention the cover-ups, particularly the Laquan McDonald, which was his, the cover-up, which was the mo worst offense at all. And it was clear that they were trying to clear the field uh, so that he wouldn't have a formidable challenger. So, so it's not like you know running for offices or running for these offices is on my bucket list. I did. Uh, I ran for the the office because I felt there needed to be an issue oriented campaign, and that I felt uh, four more years of Rom would be a disaster. You know, but, you know, obviously Lori Life was not doing much better. But the bottom line is, I felt that he needed to be challenged. I'm not doing these things because I'm plotting a another political run, or I'm even contemplating it, or I would even consider it. I'm doing the same things I did during the campaign. I'm talking about issues. Somebody needs to be talking about the importance of reopening schools. Somebody needs to be talking about uh, what a real progressive agenda is for the community and how there are th things the city council can do to really create economic conditions that will address many of the underlying costs of violence. So I'm basically continuing what I did during the campaign. I'm 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 gonna I'm I'm gonna be, uh, continue to critique issues and to offer solutions and to be a part of the public debate. But this is um, my motivation is not driven by a desire to, 
you know, uh, create conditions for another political run. It's just kind of a continuation of really what I've been doing the last couple of years. Paul Vallis, thanks for the time. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.